I thought that I came into this project with a, a, a fair fluency about civil rights in America and realized how, um, how little I knew about the Asian American struggle. Um, and one of the most difficult things for me about making this movie was figuring out how to fit such a rich organizational history into such a short period of time because I think AFI has done and achieved so many remarkable things in the past 40 years that I could have easily made this film an hour and a half. Um, and um, I also, as, as, a, as a lifelong activist and advocate myself, I, I feel like AFI for me, I, I've, I've developed this real profound respect for the organization as a model for what activist and advocacy organizations can grow up and become. Um, I know plenty of activists that I've worked with for decades who are out there still, you know, um, as the voice in the wilderness, uh, fighting the good fight against, um, you know, uh, conventional powers and, um, and I think, What's really remarkable to me about is about how is how AFI has put their action productively into tangible outcomes that really help the community, um, and so I think I just uh, I, I want to really I, I do want to thank AFI for the opportunity to to spend all this time uh, working on this film. Um, and I appreciate everyone's time who is so gracious with coming in to interview. Um, I have spent more hours with you in my edit suite than you could possibly ever know. Um, but uh, I really enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you for taking the time to watch the film. I think we're going to do a Q&A now. I'm not quite sure who's coming up, but uh, I'm not the MC here tonight. Oh, and by the way, I should mention that the film's going to be available online. There's some sound issues tonight. Um, I know I certainly couldn't hear it as well as I would have liked to have, and there is a soundtrack um, that's, uh, you know, um, it's, for me, it's a richer experience to be able to hear everything more clearly. It's going to be available online uh, for anybody to watch at any time you would like, so you'll have that opportunity to view it again or pass it along to people. So thank you very much. All right, uh, now you're going to get a chance to meet some of the people you just saw in the documentary. And I think everyone in this documentary is going to be at um, the cocktail reception afterwards. So uh, please talk to them. Um, Bill Chong is the commissioner of the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. He has been active for 25 years. He worked at Citizens Committee, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, and he was president of AFI during the development of its first equality house in 1988. Fei Chu Matsuda has been involved as a community organizer since the 1970s. Um, she has worked at Hamilton Madison House, Brooklyn Children's Museum, Museum of Chinese in America, and uh, the Chinatown Health Clinic. And then, uh, last but not least, Yiling Poon is a founder and former president of AFI as well. She was editor-in-chief of the Equality, AFI's newspaper, a member of Basement Workshop and the Chinese Historical Society, and she is currently an attorney for the undocumented political exiles and family reunification. Um, so I want to start off uh, the panel with a couple questions and then we're going to open it up to the audience. 
Um, I think one of the major themes in this film is that Afi um, actually grew out of a social movement. Uh, it is now an institution, it employs many people, but Afi at its core um, came from a really dynamic, vibrant network of people um, that were all fighting for, as you pointed out, civil rights, for human rights. Um, and that was the Asian American movement in the 1970s. Um, so I'm wondering if each one of you could talk a little bit about what that Asian American movement was to you and why you joined it, why you decided to give some time to it. Uh, and then maybe Peter, if you could talk about what was most surprising to you in learning about this history. Just start with Bill. Uh, so I think for me what was, and then I, I, I've told my, my younger staff that when I grew up in, uh, in this city, in the 50s and 60s, there weren't that many Asian Americans. I mean, I grew up in East New York, which at the time was a, an Italian neighborhood that quickly uh, became African American and Latino. And so the idea of, uh, of being Asian was foreign to me. Uh, it really wasn't until I started working with Afi and I realized the strength that we had as a community. But at that time, and it's hard to imagine today when I live in Forest Hills, Queens, and I, every other person is Asian American, that how different the city is today. But back then, Asians were very much a solid and almost <coughs> overlooked uh, group. Me? Well, actually, I did not. I, I, I grew up in Hong Kong. I wanted to probably the only one that didn't have an upbringing in the United States. Uh, what really happened is that I went to a very elitist high school in Hong Kong, same high school that Doris went to, Doris Cool. And so when I came here, my father was already in the United States. We couldn't come because of the immigration law. Until 65, when Johnson changed the law, then we were able to stand on the line. Uh, the first thing that struck me when I first came here is, Wow, you know, it's a complete different experience I have in Hong Kong. And I begin to realize that people that I used to be very easy to talk to and hang out with have no time for anybody. They were so consumed with day-to-day -day thing, they just had no time for family, for relatives, or friends visit. So I begin to get curious about what is why we're here. Why are all these people here? How come they were here to begin with? It's not a very nice place to begin with. <laughs> so that sparked my interest in Chinese American history. And from there, basically, you just naturally gravitated to everything around. Um, I have to admit, I wasn't the first one that actually uh, started the, um, the Confucius Plaza thing. I was actually drawn into it, but because I could write Chinese, one of the very few people, so I became very involved in the propaganda piece, the newspaper, uh, which is very important. <laughs> very important because at the time, the community was against everything. Uh, the, all the mainstream newspaper in the local community was against uh, the rally, was against everything. They're so afraid the government will come down on us because they remember in the 50s, the McCarthy era, remember? And all the activists in Chinatown got into trouble. They were actually being arrested, being deported. So there are a lot of kind of fear that if you say things loud against the government, they will come back to, to, to get you. So we have to counter every single rumor, negative, any kind of thing that we're against the demonstration with day-to-day -day newspaper. So I was, that's why you never saw me in the front. Girl, I was <laughs> the back writing. <laughs> and so, and then uh, came the, so then we started Effie, kind of naturally. My first taste in politics, quote unquote politics, was actually in a school board election. My first job after college, I came here for college, even though I, I graduated from high school. And then I saw there was a District 1 community school board. There was a school boycott the second day of my job. Everybody, I said, what is this all about, you know? So I get involved in that, trying to organize Chinese parents to elect a local uh, school board. And so I organized the first campaign and get the first Chinese American ever elected in a in some kind of local election, the school board. So that is how I get involved. When the Peter Yeo thing, the police paternity came out, I issued the first propaganda piece again. <laughs> that get the whole community going. So then eventually it was 5,000 people, 20,000 people. So a lot of it because of my background, seeing a big contrast between the way I was 
grew up in Hong Kong, and like this is not a very nice place to live, you know. And I want to find out why people want to come here since it's such a lousy place, you know. <laughs> so and then I said, that, okay, that's why they are here, and I got involved to make the place better for other people, including my parents. You know, that's it. I think like Yiling and many other people who joined the movement back in the late 60s and early 70s, a lot of it is about our families. I'm uh, New York born and raised. My parents are immigrants from China. Um, and it was a succession of laundries and Chinese restaurants and garment factories that were the economic um, base for our family. So from very early on, I could really see all the struggles of working people who were, you know, limited in English. And whatever they did in China didn't matter because of the lack of English and the opportunities. And so I felt even though my Chinese is, was not then, nor is it now, any good, really. Um, but I knew that I knew something, and I knew more than any social workers in those days. In social work school, which is where I wound up going after college, um, I just thought, I've got to get back to the community. For some reason, instead of just doing it, I decided to go to grad school. But afterwards, I got into Hamilton Madison House, which is where I am today after like being away and around in so many other places. And Hamilton Madison House in those days had a CO department, community organizing. Doesn't have one now, but it did in those days in the 70s and 80s. And actually, um, my earliest connections to Asian Americans for Equal Employment and about Confucius Plaza was really because I, I saw the natural, obvious uh, connection between the job that I was paid to do and what was happening in the community. But one day my boss, Harvey Newman, did say to me, Faye, if you're going to do that demonstration and you think you're going to be arrested, take the day off because I don't want you to be working while you're getting arrested. So I did. And I did. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, I mean, in a nutshell, I mean, that's how I, I got involved. And then the rest is just opportunities to uh, continue connecting and, and doing things that you really believe in. Peter, to share with you. Thanks. Um, I think maybe the two most surprising things, is that what you asked? What's the surprising things? One was that I, I, I had long operated under the misguided uh, impression and assumption that the civil rights movement was a monolith, that it all sort of organically happened with all of these different uh, communities. Um, and I found out that that's very much not the case. Um, and it was fascinating for me to hear the AFI members talking about how much they learned and borrowed from the uh, African-American civil rights movement and, and in a sense got to sort of follow in their wake. Um, and that, that, I, that was a real eye-opener to me. Um, the other thing is, is I was really struck by how on another level I feel like the Asian-American civil rights movement kind of blossomed out of this collective awakening of, of Asian Americans' place within American culture. And you talked about it quite a bit um, when I interviewed you. Um, I think uh, I was struck by how much of an impact um, people's experience at City College taking classes about their Asian American history really got them to think about their place in this country and then the civil rights uh, movement for Asian Americans kind of naturally flowed out of that. And some of the propaganda efforts that, that she talks about were really, my understanding is that they were aimed more towards the Chinese community and the Asian American community to educate and convince Asian Americans that you can protest, you can go out and fight for your rights, you can go out and make your voices heard, that that's part of being an American, that's part of our constitution. And, and that a lot of Chinese, particularly, but Asian Americans were reticent to do that based on some of their cultural background and, and you know, uh, familial expectations. And all of that was really hugely educational to me. Okay. I 
wanted to add two points. Because uh, at the, people talking about getting arrested, it was a planned arrest. Uh, you, people get picked to see if you're a citizen, you're allowed to be arrested. If you haven't naturalized it, you're out. So there were people that were actually handpicked and say, OK, it's civil disobedience. And actually, we learned that from fight back. Uh, at that time in Harlem, there was a, a group of uh, African-American construction workers. They've been fighting for jobs for many years. And they came down to meet with us to talk, to learn, to say, OK, I'm teaching you what to do. And they themselves went into the site with us, too. So they were actually, but they didn't ask for any job or anything. It's pure trying to help a system movement. And that's how people actually learn how to do the sit-in, we call sit-in. And people get arrested, a new batch would go in and get arrested, you know. So it's a big deal to get arrested. Not a small thing, especially in Chinatown. But they, we did. Uh, and the other thing that when I talk about the, the kind of like, uh, when I saw what I saw when I first came, uh, doesn't mean I came from a privileged family. Actually, my father was here for years as a uh, restaurant worker. And when my mother came, she became a government worker too. However, because of the money my mother, my father made here, I was able to go to a very, very elite school in Hong Kong. And that is when I came here, I saw the difference between where I hang out with the people and the place I live. It's like, wow, it's real ghetto. Uh, I remember the building I live in is like across the street, it all boarded up with all the graffiti. I was so scared even walking on the street to go home. You know, it's not the way I grew up in Hong Kong. So that's why I begin to try to understand. And I took a job in the summertime in Golden Age Club. <laughs> you were working there, right? And I did all, you know, I said, oh, this old man, he had no wives. They're all single men in the 80s and 70s and 90s, no wife and no family member. I don't understand why. So I started to do interview with all the old people and started this oral history project. Then I realized they have no wife because they're not allowed to come here because of the Exclusion Act and continue all the way till 1965. Only 105 people could come per year, when every other country, 20,000 people could come. That is the reason why there's a whole single bachelor community in Chinatown in the 70s. And I got involved because that is not fair. That's unfair. Why do people have to live their life like this? And then I see all the people are not doing any better, even though they could bring their family here. They're still living in ghettos. They get no job. They're stuck in the restaurant. They're stuck in the garment shop. We are lucky that we get a good education. We could go to school. I think we own it to the community and our parents' generation, our forebearers, to do something. And that's how many of us, in fact, get involved. And I'd also like to emphasize, um, yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, that the very term Asian American didn't really exist until 1968. So for AFI to come out in 1974, just a few years later, as Asian Americans for equal employment was a very transformational political idea that by coming together, people of very diverse heritages, uh, claiming that term Asian American, you could actually claim a political voice within America. Weird. Is that okay? someone's, doing a, someone's doing a mic test in the back. All right, uh, next question. Uh, I was like, did I say that? <laughs> um, all right, um, so the, the second major theme in um, this documentary is about growing up. Um, institutionally growing up, changing with the times, expanding your programs. Um, so my next question uh, for Bill, Yiling, and Faye is, um, you know, as individuals who are part of these different movements, uh, how did you take those skills and apply them to the work you did uh, next? Um, what did you learn from the Asian American movement that you then applied to your very diverse and very um, prolific careers? Well, for me, I can say I've come full circle. I mean, 33 years ago, yeah, September of 1981, about 33 years ago, uh, when I walked through the doors of AFI, uh, AFI was very much a grassroots organization and it was in the middle of a fight around gentrification in Chinatown. And one of the very first things I did was work with uh, 
lawyers to brainstorm a lawsuit uh, called Affy versus Koch. And you know, yeah. fast forward eight years, we're working with the Koch administration to build the first tax credit program in the city. So I think it was a growing process. And what I realized is that, and someone else mentioned, is that you know, every small grassroots organization has the potential to be a community builder. And you know, I saw that firsthand in my experiences with AFI. And so today, my job is to work with thousands of community-based organizations in the city. And I see the potential in all of them. Some may get to be an AFI and some may not, which is OK, because I think they all contribute to the fabric of that neighborhood's vitality. And, and so I think uh, it really talks about the need to have an impact, because to grow, you have to show results. Um, and the advocacy won't be able to be continued unless you can show results. And I think that's what AFI has been able to do in the last 40 years, is show results. Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. How does it show? I think there's also, like Bill, perhaps a, a full circle because I mentioned Hamilton Madison House earlier. Um, I started there around the same time that I got involved with Asian Americans for Equal Employment in the early 70s. And when Yi Ling talked about her doing the oral histories with the Golden Age Club, I am now working at the new Golden Age Club, which is called the City Hall Senior Center. But in between, I was at the Museum of Chinese in America, where, of course, the archives of all the work that you did um, wound up being uh, archived there. So there's like a lot of connections. And much like, let's say, in the cultural arts area, like Basement Workshop, which was like the uh, a seminal cultural arts organization for Asian Americans here on the East Coast. I think um, AFI, in a certain way, I would say, kind of um, pushed off a lot of people going into so many different areas. Um, and I think the skills that I personally learned included um, community organizing, being able to get up there and speak in front of a crowd of people at Chatham Square, um, or even just mobilizing people to demonstrate and to really organize people to just, you know, show with their bodies what they were really feeling and what we were demanding in the way of equal opportunity and rights. So there's a lot of stuff. I can go on and on, but I, I think the time, uh, it was like from 74 to about 76, 77, I did everything from being a part of those newspapers that you see, the propaganda that we <laughs> talked about, um, to you know just working with people. And it really uh, gave me skills that then allowed me to do other work in other organizations. Me? Well, my skill actually is in writing and advocacy and organizing. I didn't do much in terms of building up AFI as it is today, because I left AFI more or less in 1986 for NYU uh, Law School. So I went to law school after 13 years out of college, and uh, basically I need a break. <laughs> I've been working for AFI as a volunteer, basically a full-time volunteer, no pay. <laughs> and then there's no way to really like sustain our organization. I said, I need to take a break. And my way of taking a break is go to law school in NYU. <laughs> Which is, and I have two kids already by then. Uh, so I went there, and then after I graduated, uh, i not part of Effie officially, but Effie pulled me back always uh, to give talks about minority home ownership, how to buy a house, and uh, immigration uh, talks. And so I always come back to give those uh, free talks and <laughs> to whoever that need uh, the, you know, how to buy a house. Uh, I, even on my own, I would go to churches sometimes to talk about immigration issues or small business issue. In fact, uh, just two days ago, uh, Sunday, I went to a Catholic church in Queens. Uh, to talk about you know uh, immigrations and whatever questions people have, so I didn't build anything. I built up my law firm. I had a law firm in Chinatown. At one time, it's quite big. Now it's getting smaller because <laughs> I have to getting older, right? So you can't do that much, you know. So um, so I had to credit the uh, people like yourself <laughs> and all the Bill and uh, Margaret and Lydia. They are the Doris. Uh, Doris is actually my high school alumni. She's my little senior than me. And uh, for building up every the way it is today, uh, so I can't claim much credit for that. Thank you. OK, if anyone in the audience has a question for any of our panelists, please raise your hand, and we'll bring a mic around to you. Hi, 
Cocky. All right, Corky got one. And Chris Choi. It's not a question, but uh, I know that uh, Bill had a lot of enthusiasm when he was talking in the documentary, and you had stated that there's 100,000 people who uh, came out for uh, Confucius Plaza. Um, it was less than that, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Peter Yu. Uh, 20, 20,000. Peter Yu, 20. 20,000. 20. That's the size of the community. <laughs> that reunion is fact. Yeah. 20,000. It was uh, 5,000 the first one in May 12, and then May, May 12, May 19. 19, a week later, is 20,000. Basically, the whole community had a stop work on that day. All the store closed down. First time in the history of Chinatown that they closed the factory, they closed the store, everybody come out. And they even closed the gambling places. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> even the gambling places closed on that day to come out. And the New York Times article was that the dragon has arisen. That was the way they described the event because unheard of. You know, because Chinese people are not known to be protesters. And so this is so un Asian, un Chinese. And, and that was the work of the propaganda we're doing. For years, we changed the whole idea of being Chinese in America. <laughs> that you have to come out. And that's not true that there's no protest history in China, in, among Chinese, because during the uh, anti-Japanese war, you know, there were protests, big one in the community too. But there was the difference is that there were, at that time, the mainstream people, <coughs> the community leader, quote unquote traditional leader, which is based on clans and last name and regional area, they're very traditional. They were for it, that's why everybody would come out. But if they're against it, nobody would come out. And we were fighting against that trend that and to become like we are the new leaders, quote unquote, and they see that we're threatening them. And they don't want them to threaten their old traditional leadership. But on May 19, actually they themselves came along to our you know, way of protesting. And that's how we were able to get them to come up. Uh, like that, you know. We were surprised when they were said they're closing down and come out. You know, we didn't anticipate that. We had to admit, you know. All right. Any questions from the audience? Watching this documentary, I just realized a lot of leadership happened to be women, and uh, in the mid '70s, also it was the uh, rising power women's movement. Uh, was there anything internally affected Afi? You know, that's number one in terms of sexism, all right? Um, number two, the, the documentary seems like never really reflected anything that Afi had done. Perhaps it could look at as not as productive. Let me introduce this uh, uh, you don't person. Have to introduce I have to introduce you. <laughs> Her name is Chris Choi. She used to be the director of a new NYU film school, uh, the graduate division. Right now, she's teaching at the new NYU film school documentary. Right. Oh, her movie, Who Killed Vincent Chin, wins, won an Oscar. Oscar. Uh, and uh, she's a member of the Academy. She could vote for the Academy, who's the best movie, who's the best documentary. She's my guest today. Uh, the reason why I had introduced her because she is a, a documentary maker, and she's a woman, and that's why it comes from herself. <laughs> You're very entertaining. <laughs> um, Faye and Bill. That's why I'm up here. Do you <laughs> comments on kind of the they entertain everybody? The mixes of feminism. Dean, I don't Asian know. I, I don't know if I have any comments. I mean, I was. I know that the two movements were dovetailing. You know, what was happening in Chinatown with, with Afi and then also the women's, uh, you know, movement. I, I'm going to reserve that. I mean, I'm going to have to think about that one. Um, it might be a little, I don't know. It's, it, for me, there might be a little something there 
I'm going to keep it to myself for now until I'm ready to reveal like my true feelings. There could have been some. I think I always noticed that the guys always were the ones who were kind of like right up there. Um, but a lot of the side organizing or things that Yi Ling did, you know, um, were in the background. You know, and, and we kind of are there and we're like supporting. But I, I really, it's like so long ago. You're asking me 40 years back. Um, and I'm, I'm really not going to put anybody on the spot or say anything that's going to get me into trouble today. 